Hey, welcome to Soul Cafe. So glad you're with us tonight. Hopefully you've got your Bible, some coffee or tea to go along with this evening. Soul Cafe, if this is your first time with us, is an opportunity for you to midweek get spiritually refueled. I've been doing a lot of study on batteries. We're all moving to these electric cars, as you know, and, and I bought a hybrid for Pat not too long ago. And my curiosity is, how long will that battery last? And it's only going to last like two or three years, then it's got to be replaced. It's got to be recharged. And uh, it's just like that in the spiritual life. You have to be recharged in the middle of the week in order for you to make it to the finish line, come together to celebrate on Sunday, and then start a brand new week in the Spirit of God. So tonight, we are in lesson four. So if you've been following along with us, we have looked at three laws for liberated living. Uh, your outline has those blanks, so you can fill them out. The outline is found at fbcde.com. Let me give you those first three laws for liberated living. First of all, there is a vital relationship. Secondly, there is a sustained intimacy. And we looked at that a couple weeks ago about how do I sustain an intimate with walk with God after I get into vital relationship with him. Then last week, we looked at the third law, which is a recognized lordship. What does it mean to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to have Jesus as the Lord of my life? And hopefully you were able to participate in that lesson with us as well. Well, tonight we're going to add a fourth law of liberated living, and that law is a personalized revelation. Let me read a verse for you. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says this, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Now, what does that verse say? It's saying this, all these laws that we're looking at and the remaining laws that we're going to look at all are operated by faith. Faith is the lever that puts each of these laws into operation. And faith is more than belief. Faith is not believing God can do something. It's not believing that God should do something. It's not believing that God is able to do something, but faith is acting as if God is doing something right now. And what God says in his word is this, faith, how do I get more faith? I get it by hearing the word of God. As I get the word of God into my heart, as I act upon the word that is in my heart, then faith becomes the lever that places these laws we've been looking at into operation. We say, well, what is faith? Well, faith has a lot of different parts. Faith is volitional. It's an act of my will. I choose to act in faith, to believe that what God says is true. Faith is also relational. I can't have faith if I'm not in relationship with Jesus Christ. And all these laws work a lot better when I'm properly aligned with Christ. Then these laws become operational in my life. Faith is also intellectual. I believe something in my mind, that something is true, that what God says is absolutely Without denial, without hesitation, I believe that what God says is absolutely true. And then faith is also something that we do volitionally. We act as if a thing is so, even when it doesn't appear to be so, because it's already so. <laughs> you say, that's a mouthful. Well, it is, but that's how you operate in faith. Faith isn't just hearing, it's also acting on what you hear. And as I act on what I've heard through the word of God, then that faith that I'm acting on operates these laws in my life. So faith then, to give you the best definition, faith is acting on the word of God. So many people will say, well, I read the word of God, but I don't feel like I'm growing. And my question is, are you acting on the word of God? I mean, I can read all the diet books in the world, but if I don't act on what those diet books say, I'm going to stay fat. If I, my doctor can say, hey, I want, to read, I want you to read this book about how to have better health with your heart. And I can read that book and believe every word that my doctor says. I can say, that's the greatest book I've ever read about how to get rid of heart disease, how to live with a healthy heart. But if I don't do what that book says, it doesn't do me any good. I want to tell you something, folks. This book is truth. This book is truth whether you believe it or not. This book is truth whether people around you believe it or not. This, truth, this book is truth even when you don't act on it. But it becomes truth in your life when you act on what this word of God says. So let me give you that in the context of a personalized revelation. Let's look at that tonight. And if you have your Bible, look in John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 8, this is a story of Jesus and Nicodemus, probably a very familiar story to many of you, when Nicodemus, who is a religious leader in the Jewish religion, comes to Jesus by night, 
because he's a little scared to be seen with Jesus, and ask him some very important questions. Let's look at these together. John chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Verily I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. He said, that's a very strange thing for Jesus to say. Here Nicodemus comes, he's polite. He says, Jesus, I know who you are. You've got to come from God because nobody could do what you're doing if they didn't come from God. And instead of acknowledging the commendation of what Nicodemus had given him, Jesus gives him a point about the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. So Nicodemus asked the question that you and I probably would ask. Verse four, he says, how can someone be born when they are old? And Nicodemus said, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and to be born again. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water, watch this now, and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, that's an important thing. You just, you got to get this, folks. The non-Christian only lives in the flesh world, that which he can see, which she can hear, what they can experience with their sight, what they can know with their mind, what they can feel with their body. They live only in a sense world. Because when Adam and Eve sinned against God in the Garden of Eden, they lost their spirit connection with God. You may remember in Genesis that God gave us a body. He gave us a soul. But he also gave us the spirit. And it's through the spirit that we commune and have fellowship and relationship with God. Well, when man sinned against God, that spirit connection was broken. Man died in the spirit of his being. His body still existed. Heart still pumped. Lungs still breathed. His mind still worked. His, his body still functioned. But his spirit was dead. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, and this is so important that you understand this, the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is a Christian now has Christ inside of him who brings the Holy Spirit who is deposited in them so that man can be restored in his spiritual relationship with God. So here's what it is, God. Can a non-believer pray? Yes. Can a non-believer attend church? Can they serve? Can they be kind? Can they be nice? In fact, I know some non-believers that are really better people than some of the Christians I know. They can do all those things. But what they cannot do versus a Christian is spiritually relate to God. I, I, you got to understand this. That is the key difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. The Christian spirit is now made alive. It's reconnected to that lost connection that was lost in sin in the Garden of Eden. This is what Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you want to turn over there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, when Paul is talking about the Spirit and, and he's trying to help us to understand some of the things that keep us from this operating in the Spirit of God. And in verse 18, he says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, my body, my mind, the sense world, but what is unseen is eternal. So when I get the Spirit of God living inside of me, I am now connecting to that which is eternal, that which is around me. What I can see, what I can touch, what I can hear, what I can feel. There's even those people that are around me that, that don't know Jesus. They're only temporary. They're only for a short season of my entire life. But that which is spiritual lasts forever. And so when I become a Christian, folks, this allows me to not only live in the sense world, the flesh world, but it also allows me to now live in a second world that a non-Christian cannot live in. I now live also in the spirit world. You say, well, who is in the spirit world? Well, in the spirit world, you have God, you have Jesus, you have the angels, you have the seraphim, the cherubim, all those people that the Bible lists. Uh, it's where the angels uh, dwell, but it's also where the devil works. You see, the devil works in both worlds. Sometimes we, we just get the idea that he only works in the sense world. Well, if he did that, we wouldn't experience spiritual battle. <laughs> but the devil is able to also work into two worlds. He works in the spirit, which tries to battle against our spirit, who tries to lie to us, who tries to convince us of things that are not true about us or about other people. He whispers uh, junk into our mind, tries to give us to accept it as truth. He battles against our spiritual life. So the devil is able to work not only in the flesh world, but also in the spirit world. That's why we have good and evil in both worlds. But the born-again Christian versus the non-Christian is this. 
The born again person is a person, this is so exciting, that has the power of the spirit to fight the devil, to battle and win the victory, to engage the enemy and push him back, to take back the territory that the enemy has tried to steal. That is the power that a believer has in the spiritual realm. And so you need to understand, before you became a Christian, you had no spiritual power because you did not have the spirit of God living inside of you. The battle with you before you became a Christian was to keep you lost. <laughs> now the battle after you become a Christian <laughs> is not to keep you lost because the devil knows he believes in eternal security as well. He believes that once you're saved, you're always saved. The devil believes that. But what the devil tries to do is hinder your effectiveness as a believer. He tries to hold you down, keep you down, convince you that you're not able to try to move you into a position where you feel like you're inadequate to serve or to do the things that God is calling you to do. So his whole battle is with your adequacy, your effectiveness as a believer. And that fight is often in the spiritual world. Well, how, how do we understand that? Well, let me give you three things on your outline that may help you understand discerning the will of God in terms of a personalized revelation. How does God speak to us personally so that we can understand it's God who's speaking and giving us truth? Well, let me give you three things. First of all is we discern the will of God when we have a need and God speaks to us through that need. Every need in your life is an opportunity for God to speak. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 17, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his bowels of compassion, is what the King James Version, I, I love that, bowels of compassion. If he shuts them up from that brother in need, how does the love of God dwell in that person? What, what is John saying? He's saying, listen, if you see somebody in need and you don't meet that need and you've got the resources to do it, the Bible questions your Christianity. Because every need that you have, there is someone out there who is the supply for your need. Rarely does God materialize like beam me up Scotty from Star Trek and, and beam to you what you need. Normally, God meets your needs through the people he has placed in your life or even surprise people that come into your life. We meet, that's why we have church. We meet each other's needs spiritually, relationally, physically. Just this week, we, we helped someone on the mission field in Africa, one of our missionaries who was going through some severe needs, and we sent some extra, we, we, pay, we give them money every month, but we gave them an extra $500 this month to help them in that need. We've got one of our widows who's in need of a car right now, and we're, our pastors are searching to buy a car for that widow so that she can get around and get to her doctor's appointments. That's what the church is all about. Now, she has a need, we have supply. And how God connects need and supply is he brings the awareness of that need into our life so that we can become the supply for somebody else's need and vice versa. When you have a need, God has a supply. Listen, there is never a need that there first isn't supply already ordained by God. So before a need comes into your personal life, God's already got a supply. And God brings that supply to you and through another person to meet the need that he has played. That's how God, one of the ways how God gives us a personalized revelation of himself is through the needs we go through in life. Here's the second way that we can know the will of God and how God speaks to us in a personalized revelation, and that is through the desires of our heart. Listen to this verse, John 15, 7. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it shall be done. Then he says in Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Those two powerful verses share with me the fact that when my desires are embedded in the desires of God for my life, nothing is withheld from me. God says he gives me the desires of my heart. Jesus in his own word says, when you abide in him, his words abide in you. Ask whatever you will and it's already done for you. You say, man, I'd love to have that. Just push the button. Now, we're not talking about name it and claim it. We're not, we're not shake it and fake it. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is your desires are, you, you are so embedded in the things of God. You know the heart of God. You're walking in the things of God to such a degree that your desires and God's desires become one. And then when you are operating in that state, when you're abiding in Jesus to the point that your desires are God's desires and vice versa, then whatever you need, whatever you desire comes 
because it's the desire of God for you. God speaks to us through our need. He speaks to us also through our desires. And there's a third thing, a third way that God reveals his will to us and how we get a personalized revelation, and that is for him to give us a word. He takes a specific word from this book and makes it applicable to our life. I remember when I was praying about what I should do. I was in a church, my first church in Orlando, Florida. I was there six and a half years and loved it. Had a lot of people coming and a lot of young couples that we were felt. Pat and I were in our late 20s. And this opportunity came up to go to West Virginia and to uh, take over uh, just an opportunity of need that was there that would eventually form a new church and become the largest church at that time in West Virginia over the next several years. God did a miraculous thing there. But, but I had to debate. I had to, I had to argue. I, I had to search the will of God. God, do you want me to leave all my friends, my church, my, all my family is in Orlando at that time and go to a place that I had never lived, to a place where I knew nobody, to a place that I, to do something I'd never done before, start a church. <laughs> I had never gone through one course in college or seminary on how to start a church. And yet, in spite of all of that, I sat down one Thursday morning and said, God, I don't know what to do. I feel like my desires are lined up with your desires. I feel like that I'm, I'm doing what, you're, what I'm supposed to be doing as far as I know. God, uh, you've given me an opportunity and, and there's a need in that area, but I don't know if, if I'm the one that's supposed to be doing it. So God, you've got to show me. Give me a personal word. And so I opened the Bible to Isaiah 6. Didn't intend to open it there. And I read that verse when Isaiah the prophet says, as he's quoting God, he says, who will go for me? Who will I send? And Isaiah pops up and says, I'll go. And I said, God, you just gave me a word. Now, that wasn't a word for you. It wasn't a word for my friends. It wasn't a word for any of my other pastors in our church. It was a word for Ron and Pat Larson. Move 800 miles north to a town... <laughs> You knew no one to do something you'd never done before in and, and, and your late 20s and go and, and, start, the, and just start this ministry. And, and God says, and I, because if you will act in faith that I am calling you to this, I will bless you with much. I'll give you the desires of your heart. That was a personal word that God gave to us. And guys, if you are abiding in the word, if you're getting in the word and reading it, if you're allowing God to speak to your heart through his word, there will be times when you just read a verse or a story or a passage or a parable and you go, that is, exact, that is speaking to me today. Thank you, Jesus. That, that, that is a word straight from heaven for my life today. You could have read that passage last month and it was not a word for you. You could read that passage a month from now and it's not a word for you. But today, it's a word for you because of the current situation of your life. That's what it means to get a personal word from God. You say, well, how does that happen? Let me close tonight by saying this, because you've got to understand that all truth is almost like it's placed in a vault. And it's precious and it's valuable and it's priceless. But if you never open the vault and take it out and use it, you can have a million dollars in a vault, but if you never take any of the money out and spend it, <laughs> what use is it? I mean, it's great to know it's there. It's, it's wonderful security. Say, oh, thank you. I got a million dollars in the bank. But if you never take any of the money out and use it, to meet needs in your life or to bless somebody else, what value is that million dollars sitting in a vault? What value is the word of God if all you ever do is listen to somebody else teach it or read it for yourself in the morning in daily devotionals? Until you act on that truth, take that truth out of the vault and put it into application in your life, it has little value for your life. So uh, there's a couple of stories I think of in the Bible. I think of Gideon, first of all, who... <laughs> was in a time when the Midianites were oppressing his people and every time the people had a harvest, the Midianites would come in and either destroy it or take the harvest for themselves. His people are living in poverty. He's from the lowest clan of all the clans of Israel. He's, he's the runt of the litter and he's there one day just working his job and an angel shows up and says, hey, valid servant of the Lord. Hey, man of valor. <laughs> and Gideon, I think, is just looking around going, is there somebody else here but me? <laughs> now he was alone, him and that angel. And he says to the angel, how can you say that when our nation is going through such terrible times and, and I'm the least of the least of my people? How can you say a mighty man of valor? And the angel says something about him. He gives him a personal word only to Gideon. Didn't give it to Gideon's brother, didn't give it to his daddy, didn't give it to his uncle. He gave it to Gideon, a personal word. Gideon, you are a man of valor and you are gonna deliver God's people from their oppressors. What a word from God through this angel. 
I, I think of uh, Elisha the prophet, and one time the Syrian army was trying to capture them, and they're all marched out, just probably thousands upon thousands of soldiers outside the house where Elisha and his servant were hiding, and, and Elijah... Uh, watches his servant go and he looks out and he sees all these thousands of people and he says to his master these words he says they've come to take us there's a mighty host out there <clears throat> and almost as if he's saying lord <clears throat> you know uh why should, what, what are we going to do we we're outnumbered 10,000 to 2 <laughs> I mean, he could not see. He didn't have a word from God. But Elijah had a word from God. And so God, he says to God, Lord, let the scales fall from this young man's eyes. And instantly, he could see in the spirit what he could not see in the sense world. God opened the servant's eyes so he could see the heavenly hosts that were surrounding the Syrian army and was going to take them out and protect Elijah and the servant. You see, Sometimes we operate in a fog. Sometimes we walk around not knowing what to do. Sometimes we are so confused as to our next steps. And what we need to do in those times is not ask everybody, what do you think we ought to do? Not post on Facebook, hey, I'm looking for advice. But we need to go straight to God's word and keep reading it until we get a word from God that is for me. A personalized word where God takes his word and makes it personal to my life becomes a personalized revelation for my life. And then when I hear that word and act on that word, this is important to remember, act on that word by faith. I can't see how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't even believe that it might happen. But I'm going to go ahead and act in spite of all that I cannot understand, cannot see, cannot feel. Cannot. I'm going to act on what is crazy. I'm going to act on what God is saying. It doesn't make sense. It is humanly impossible. It's far beyond my resources, but God has said this out of his word to my heart, and I'm going to act on it. When I act on my personalized revelation from God, then faith becomes the lever that brings the supply to my need. Here's my question to you tonight as we wrap up. I wonder in your own heart tonight, what is God saying? You say, well, he's not saying anything. Well, if God's, not say, if God's not talking to you, it's not his problem, it's your problem. Because God's always talking to us. He's a father. He talks to his children. The question is, are we listening? Are we getting into his word on a daily basis and saying, God, speak to me through your word? And sometimes God goes days without speaking to us, a personalized revelation. Sometimes he may go through an entire season. But there's going to be that moment when we are in a need we're in a crisis, we're in a situation, we're in a circumstance, and a verse comes across, just like it did to me 34 years ago on moving to West Virginia when I read Isaiah 6, who will go for us? Whom will I send? And I said, here I am, Lord. I felt like that was a personalized word. There may be a need in your life you cannot meet right now. You just keep reading God's word until he gives you a word from his word that becomes truth, that becomes converted into reality, through your faith. And when you act on that personalized word, I'm telling you, victory comes. As we pray right now, I want to ask the Lord to speak to your heart. And I want him to very graciously, but very compellingly, pull down every veil, remove every curtain, that is hiding the truth from your heart. Every sin confessed so that God will speak. Every excuse abandoned so that God can touch your heart. Every hesitation let go so that God can enable your mind to believe him that he's already sent his supply for the need you have. He's already given you a truth for the decision you're trying to make. He's already made a way through the obstacles that stand in front of you. And I pray tonight in Jesus' name, whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, that tonight you would just pull down every dark curtain and hear the voice of God. 
that you'll get into the word if he hasn't spoken yet and stay in that word until you get a word from God about your situation. And then I pray that you may act in faith and see the victory. God, I pray this for every single person today in Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, would you look this way for just a moment? In your small groups this week, you're gonna be talking about some discussion questions that go along with this week's lesson. And I hope that you'll be in a virtual group. If you're not in one yet, uh, go to fbcde.com or go to our FBCDE app. There are about two dozen or so groups you can pick from that meet at different days of the week, different times. Some are from women, some are mixed groups, some are for only men. And you can pick the group that best fits who you are when you can meet. They're all virtual right now with the exception of two or three. Uh, we're gonna be adding some on-site groups later on, but right now most of our groups are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your home, but the important thing is you're connecting with other people, you're learning how to obey what we're teaching on Wednesday nights into your life, and you've got some friends helping to walk this journey with you for accountability. That is so powerful to get the Word of God operating in your life in a consistent way. We're also going to take our offering tonight. They're flashing up the information about how to give electronically, or you can mail in a check. The address is at fbcde.com. You can bring a check if you're coming Sunday. Have However you would like to do it, but these are some ways uh, that uh, you can participate in keeping the ministry of this church going. Some of you have given already this week to make sure that our children's area gets improved. We're still looking for a little bit more funding to come in for that, but we're over halfway there, and uh, the painting has already started. I saw orange going on today <laughs> and uh, talked with Miss Tammy, our children's director today, and she's ordering other signage and things that will make this a kids-friendly area. Uh, something we've not have had is a designated kids-friendly area at First Baptist, but we're making that possible, not because uh, of our resources, but because of yours. You're giving to make that happen. Thank you for doing that, folks. And that's just one of the small areas that your fundings go for each week. So thank you, thank you, thank you for giving. Hey, just a reminder that this Sunday is Father's Day. We're going to be honoring all the dads. We're going to be remembering fathers who have passed on but it's going to be at 10 o'clock. So don't forget, don't come at 930. You'll be there too early. Or if you just want to hang out with us, that's fine. Don't come at 11 or you're going to miss it. 10 o'clock this Sunday, followed by games, bouncy houses, and a cookout, and all kinds of fun. And come meet some of the people you may not even know. Go to First Baptist. Come and meet them this Sunday, 10 o'clock, one giant service, outdoors, do it from your car, bring your lawn chair, bring sleeping bags, whatever you want, but you can't sleep during the sermon. Just come. Be with us on Father's Day this Sunday at 10 a.m. Guys, you have a great week. We'll see you next week at Soul Cafe.
Thank you.